for these things, uh, some of the ones that might be more of an issue than, an, uh, than another. So I'm going to go with snakes first. That seems to be the one that could be uh, probably the most dangerous in a certain sense. Over by the uh, break area in the back, uh, in the uh, parking lot area, uh, where that ditch is, you know, it's a common place that y'all like to, uh, you know, have a break and uh, take a load off. We put a snake barrier there specifically because of the ditch and the fact that it holds <coughs> That's really the key to that area. You have the high grass area and you have the water and in the culvert. So that makes a natural habitat where a snake might be. Uh, with the picnic bench and the garbage can and things like that, it's an area that you're sitting or you know could just be in a single spot, just minding your business, talking, having eye contact with somebody and not necessarily looking at the ground. So that's why we have a barrier in place specifically to protect for that. We've already caught five or six in that given area, and with the weather and a few things, it continually needs maintenance, so there may even be more than that. The most common snake we're catching is generally some type of water snake, king snake, rat snake, something like that. But the key to it is if it's something poisonous. You know, if any snake bites you, it can have a variety of bacteria or something like that associated in its teeth. So, excuse me, too much cutting that snake. Um, so if you get bit by a snake, of course, that's never good. If it's a non-venomous snake, then there's a few things you can do here. Uh, just uh, getting to a safety area where they have uh, you know, some type of alcohol or something like that. You can try to clean the wound real good, wash it soap and water, you know, rinse it out thoroughly, uh, that sort of thing, and uh, you know, should be okay. You definitely don't want to ignore a snake bite because you know the bacteria could get you. If it is a venomous snake, then that's a whole new ball. You know, in areas such as Hexion or PPE, it's such a priority. More than likely, that would be an ER visit to some degree because, depending on the nature and the size and which type of snake it is, that could be a real issue. Now, as far as the venomous snakes here, we really only have two that are, are mainly here, and that is the copperhead and the water bottle. Uh, the water moccasin stinks pretty bad. It could be uh, viable near the ditch area. Uh, the copperheads, uh, probably not so much, even though we tend to have more in our given area. That's something you might more see in your personal homes. You know, if you're going to be doing some raking around the home where the bushes uh, are, there might be a high level of debris, dead leaves, that sort of thing. Uh, that might be where you might find a copperhead. Now, to talk about the coloring and the shapes of their heads and that sort of thing, I find that it gets confusing. You know, when you're looking at a snake, they blend <coughs> well in the grass. Um, you know, there's a few different ways. Uh, you can look at its eyeball. If its eyeball is circle like a person's, then it's a non-venomous snake. If it has a slit like a cat, then it is venomous. So if you see the slit in the eye, but again, Slithing around, oh my God, run away! You know, you might not notice that. You know, so what I find the best way to do it is assuming you've killed it or you know whacked it in some way. If you're able to look at the bottom, of it, this is really the easiest way to tell where it goes to the bathroom. This little bum hole, that's the divider line. On its stomach, it has straight horizontal lines. Once you hit its anus and then go below that, if it is a venomous snake, it continues to be straight lines all the way across it. Nothing changes. That's a venomous snake. If it begun, begins to be interlocking V's, like some kind of zigzag pattern that looks kind of like that, then it is a non-venomous snake. So that's really what you want to find. But the biggest key to it is to leave it alone. You know, that's what we're here. You know, we're on call. If y'all see one, a uh, star or a lady can give us a call, what have you, and uh, we'll respond, get it out of here for you, that sort of thing. But uh, so the best thing to do is to identify it, recognize that it's there, clear the area, and uh, more than likely it'll be on its way shortly. But by the we still here by the time we arrive, you know, we'll get that out of here. Uh, they can strike very quickly, so you don't really you don't want to mess with it or toy with it because uh, they are they are fast. Um, I'm trained and I mess with them quite a bit. And it was maybe two years ago or so. I was in a hospital, and they had those little sliding doors, and it was literally sitting in a little sliding door, 
So, you know, me having the hero syndrome, I reach in there and grab it, and of course they bit me. It was a non-poisonous snake, so it didn't matter from my perspective. I've got all the squirts and stuff I need with me. But it did remind me that, you know, even when I know what I'm doing, paying attention, I was being careful, I was at a hospital, there was people everywhere, I didn't want to look bad or silly, but nonetheless it still reached around and got me. So uh, even the best of us that know what we're doing, you know, can get hit by a snake. So it's best to leave it be. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, well, they are over by the ditch, this whole area up where the train tracks and all of that, this whole side will be vulnerable. As we get into the building, uh, it becomes uh, less vulnerable, I mean less places they can be. They can hang and fall down and stuff from the areas over here, but they would need a reason to be there. Uh, they would need some mice or some rats or something like that to check, taste, and want to eat. Inside the building, that's not so much the case. We've had a few mice here, honestly, <laughs> down in here, uh, but that was a few years back. It really hasn't been in, I don't know, probably a year and a half at least. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's something about the snakes is, uh, you know, they do strike. Uh, there are several kinds around. Uh, the copperhead and the water moccasin are really probably the only two to be concerned about. Every now and then there could be a coral snake or possibly a rattlesnake, but they're really not so much in the area, but every now and then. <coughs> so, any questions about some snakes before I move on? Yes, sir. Do they feed on spiders? Uh, <laughs> Well, yes and no. I would say no as a generality, but when you have a real small snake, I wouldn't be surprised if it lunged toward one at one point. But uh, I haven't really heard of that in their diet. I don't know if they will eat small bugs and such, but they're small. That's why I asked them. Yeah. I know we have a lot of spiders around. Yeah, yeah, I know okay. they eat bugs, but I don't know. All right, well, uh, if you win the raffle, I'm the man. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, well, let me then lead in the spiders out. That would be the next thing, because that's actually uh, the bigger part of what our service here at Exion is for. Uh, we cover a lot of things, but the main thing that we're doing when we show up here is to protect you from spiders. Uh, being a high-rise uh, area, with the water being in a close proximity, it just uh, makes a nice habitat for spiders. There's a few high structures in the area, but for the most part, you know, it's kind of wide open spaces coming to a high structure. So that's going to have a tendency to bring some in. Now there's all kinds of spiders, millions of different species. So really to try to go through, you know, which ones are what is kind of irrelevant. I can keep it broken down pretty simple. There's really only three spiders that we need to pay attention to. Um, all spider bites, same as the snake, can carry a certain level of bacteria. You can get a bump on you, like a pimple, or kind of like a fire ant bite. You know, there's a variety of different ways you may react. But ultimately, it's a minor situation, except for three. And the three we need to worry about is, uh, is that a little spider? That's a little spider there. Yeah. Is uh, the brown recluse spider, the black widow spider, and the brown widow spider. And each of those three can very easily be identified when you know what you're looking for. All the other spiders, uh, you know, are creepy and you don't want it crawling on you. And me personally, I, oh, I hate this. I've been doing this for 20 years and I still run into this. Be under a house crawling around and there's be spider webs around and it's dark. And you know, I'm a skinny guy. I get into real tight spaces and just crawl into a spider web. Man, I just I hate it. I'm just saying. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, if y'all are up there and, you know, you're walking around and there happens to be a spider web stringing along and it hits <coughs> your face and your helmet and you feel it, I mean, just a natural reaction is to start flinging and running and, you know, getting out of that web. But the truth of it is, particularly in a high-rise facility, you don't want to trip, you know, you don't want to stumble, you don't want to knock, bump, anything like that. So if you were to happen to run through a spider web, three spiders I'm about to talk about, it's not one of those three. So even though it's creepy and you just run through a spider web, it's harmless. It truly is harmless. So to lose your composure, to fall down the stairs, you know, something like that, do your best to just remember, okay, I just walked through a spider web. It's not one of those three, albeit it's creepy and you hate it. But it's definitely not worth risking your safety by having a negative reaction and trying to run away from it. But here's the three we need to pay attention to. 
The brown recluse is the first and foremost. It is definitely uh, the danger center three. Uh, when it bites you, it'll leave two little black holes, and those black holes just get bigger <laughs> until such time that you go to the doctor and you know they can fix you right up. But but it will grow, it will swell, and it, it's it's <coughs> nasty. It's the worst bite that that we have locally. And what the brown recluse, how you, you tell, is it looks very similar to the wolf spider in the aspect that the wolf spider has a light tone around its legs and a darker tone here in the middle. What's different with a um, <coughs> brown recluse is its technical name, in a certain sense, is a violin spider. The reason they call it a violin spider is a very prominent violin marking right here where that is a solid brown streak. The head part up here, not this bottom part, but the head part up top makes a perfect violin shape. It has you know, the, the string part comes down around the neck, a little gap inside, and then I mean, it's just perfect. You almost see them playing, but they call it a violin spider. But that's how you identify, you see what it is. But by the nature of it being a brown recluse, it is in a hidden type area. So really, the locker cabinet, uh, if there's a uh, piece of uh, servicing that y'all might do, or you might open up the panel and reach into a dark spot, you know, those are the types of areas that they'll be. Now, most commonly, you're going to find them more in, um, say, uh, you have a, a camp or a storage room that, uh, that's not activated a lot have some boots in there. I don't know if y'all have some raiders. It might be in a storage closet that you know you use every uh, <laughs> sound sounds familiar, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, so sometimes it's a good idea uh, before you put on some boots that might have been in storage for a while to shake them out or you know kind of bounce them and see if anything comes out. Um, but uh, that's really the key to it is a locker. Uh, if there's an area, as I've seen before, if there's an area that y'all need maintenance and open up a you know, panel or stick your hand in to twist a knob or something like that, you might want to pay attention if there's a spider. If there is, again, we can respond and handle that. But uh, to simply go in with a, uh, a glove and uh, a cloth or a stick or some type of rod and just kind of you know, clean out any webbing that may exist, uh, more than likely be sufficient for you know performing the task. But just want to make sure that you don't blindly stick your hand into something without a glove because you could definitely you know get some type of bite. Uh, but of course, what we want to pay attention to is wood spider it is, and the brown recluse, the violin spider would be those areas. The other two you'd have to pay like to pay attention to is a black widow or a brown widow. They're both widows, but the black widow has a more potent bite than the brown. The black widow is a menacing spider. It's a jet, jet black spider with a dark red hourglass on its stomach and a little red dot on its butt. But uh, the dark red hourglass on its stomach is what it's famous for. Uh, where you would find those is uh, they'd be more on the outside of the building, down low. Um, the uh, siding pretty much goes to the ground over here and over here, you know, it's a high concrete area. So, uh, so it doesn't have the really the right circumstance here to have a lot of black widows. But around your home, excuse me, where uh, the siding of the house may come down and the slab is maybe this far off the ground, excuse me again, or perhaps where if you have a pier home, where the pier comes up and meets the bottom of the home, uh, that area. A black widow spider, uh, you can kind of find where its habitat is in a down low area, but it's a very messy web. It's not a pretty web you take a picture of. You know, it's a real messy, chaotic, nasty looking web, and it's gonna be down low. So if y'all were to you know, run around there, turn a spigot, and see something like that, uh, that's what you would want to pay attention to there. Um, they're pretty quick. They're, they'll be hidden. You don't really necessarily see them until you bump their web, and they, uh, they come out pretty quickly. But they're not in the same area as a, as a brown recluse where you'd be sticking your hand or putting your foot into something. It wouldn't be like that. You would just hit its web, and then you would see it run out. So all you really need to do is step back. You really wouldn't be in too much of a position to, to be bitten by it. Now the brown widow, 
Uh, they're really the most prominent. They're kind of everywhere. They can get up just anywhere uh, where all spiders you see get. They don't have any real special hiding thing to them. But they're easily identified by their egg sac. They have egg sacs everywhere, and I forget the name of it, but if you think about a medieval weapon, the ball with spikes on it that's at the end of the chain, chain around, yeah. that's a, that ball with the spikes is exactly what their web looks like, or their, their egg sac looks like. So if you see a bunch of egg sacs running around with the ball with spikes in it, then that's a brown web, so you want to stay clear of that. But it is the least potent of the three spiders uh, that, that will cause harm. Uh, but they are also the most prominent, so you're most likely to see them. So they're a brown spider. Uh, their legs kind of have a little bit of, uh, I guess it's striping. It's uh, dark, light, dark, light. And uh, then they have a faint orange hourglass on their belly instead of a uh, deep red one. It's a faint orange one, but the hourglass is pretty much the same. Um, so that's the spiders that, uh, that could cause harm. Uh, most of the ones that we experience here are of the species that do not, uh, but they also will have web streams running through that you can walk through and you know, pay you alarm. Uh, to me, that's probably the most spider risk here, is to just become panicky that you've got webs on you and, and cause you to stumble or something like that. Uh, you know, again, we treat the facility uh, the lockers and everything are here in a clean spot and all of that. It's usually more of a, like a camp facility or maybe a boat where you, you know, you haven't had it out in the water and one of the panels you open up, you know, there might be something in there. Uh, so those are more kind of areas that you might actually get into them. You know, they are possible at the facility, but not so. Now, so. Now, Ricky, I got a question on sure. that one because you and I have had some other discussions about this, but it's my understanding, I mean, just because of us being in what would be closer to natural habitat, oh, there's yeah. no deterrence. It's, it's if we have a problem, it's, 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 we have to spray, we've got to kill, exactly. eradicate, get them out, but there's no deterrence that you know of to, to reduce that number. Correct, and that's what I was speaking to of being a, um, a high building in an open area. If you think about if, uh, if anyone has seen the movie Charlotte's Web, little cartoon, they do a great job of presenting this little thing. When the spiders are gonna go off on their own, they literally can make these little web parachutes and just get caught up in the wind and swoop over. So they can literally cover you know, the entire field and land somewhere on the side of the building. So they, so, and that's one of the challenges. We could you know, do a spray and a barrier and do 200 yards around the building, but you know, they can float in from way over there and plop and, and get started again. Uh, so that is one of the reasons that we have a regular service out here because the truth of it is, you know, it's kind of trying to bat the rain away. It's just going to keep coming, just keep coming. But, you know, you've got to do something. You know, uh, Texian is very clearly with, you know, having the, the, with the meetings and such today. They're, you know, want to make sure that everyone's safe and this is a good place to work and you don't have these types of things going on. Uh, so we do provide a regular service. But again, being close to the river, the woods around, the field, being the only high structure in a given location, all those really uh, hot spots for a spider to want to find a harbor area. Thank you. Carrying on the hopper cars too, you know, we get so many that going through the woods and everything show up here. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, box cars for sure. Yeah. I had a question on the, I don't know if it's the correct pronunciation for the spider, but I think they've been called like banana spiders. Yes. They're really huge when you go out right. in the woods yeah. and stuff. Right. And yeah. I've heard they're harmless or they're they are. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's an orchid spider and uh, you're right, they're huge. They get this big. Um, black, and yellow. Black, black and yellow. Black and yellow is, yeah, yeah. they scared yeah. crap. Scary, scary, scary ones, yeah. Remember yeah. yeah. we had that one on the hexatope the other day? Yeah, I've had several accounts uh, <laughs> shown on residential uh, routes and where they go around and sometimes it's too yeah. late. Yeah. They have a really pretty What's leg that? that has like a Z pattern right. in it. And uh, my job when I'm at someone's home is to kill bugs. You know, I'm not thinking that you got a pet or that you can watch this thing grow and it's what you do with your coffee. So I'd be going around and killing stuff. 
So uh, one day I did, I whacked one, and then the lady told me after the fact, are you sure not to spray the spider? I watch him every morning. Every morning. <laughs> 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 Oops. <laughs> it happens. Not anymore. Like he's not going to move around. Yeah, I had another gentleman, uh, this is pretty, pretty interesting. He lived in one of the high-rise apartments, and uh, he had a spider that he watched outside of his window. And we were doing high-rise apartments, that's more of a roach thing. You know, we'll definitely take care of a spider again if they have that. But we're focused on roaches, you know, it's a very specific service that you're providing. And uh, but every, time, every day we'd go there, you know, he would remind us, be sure not to spray my spider, I love my spider. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, you're spraying. All right, have a great day. Is it true that spiders that slip, they have slip body, they poison, because they burn it in Well, you know, I haven't heard it uh, put that way, but as I run it through my head, uh, yeah, that's kind of true. Uh, they're all furry by definition. When you okay. look under them in a microscope, every one of them is furry. But as far as from the eye, yeah, it's really the skinny ones that are going to get you, not the big puppy scary ones. Yeah. And with snakes, is it true? Are, 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 are they afraid of bumpers? No, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> yeah, we as a service, it's one of the reasons that we have the, uh, the barrier installed over by the break area. I've been like seven doing it for 20 or 20 plus years now, and for years and years and years, I was doing all sorts of things. We bought the Snake Away product, you get it at Home Depot or Walmart, and when you read the label, it is naphthalene, which is mothballed. That's just the fancy word for mothballed, it's naphthalene sulfur and then inert ingredients which is clay. They're basically throwing dirt mothballs and sulfur around. So in that I've made my own solutions of mothballs and, and moth crystals and all sorts of things. We've ordered all kinds of junk, different forms of uh, sulfur from the powders to the little pellets and mixed them all up in a variety of combinations. But through that 20 years experience, I have seen too many snakes just crawl right through them, doing everything. Last year, I was at a, uh, I was doing an armadillo job for a lady, and I was messing with, with something running, I forget exactly what I was doing, but I was messing with something that was on my hands and knees, and she had mothballs everywhere because of the armadillo. There's a little darker snake, you know, little slick, little green and black ones, and just slithered, I mean, literally went under the mothball and just slithered away from me. Right. There's the answer to the question. I've <laughs> actually Deuce. seen its body on the mothball. Like, what about Deuce? It doesn't care. What about Deuce? What about what? Diesel? Fuel. Well, I'm sorry? What about Diesel Fuel? Diesel Fuel, yeah, Deuce. that's, yeah. Um, I've heard a variety of things uh, that Pisa works really well on, um, being that, you know, in the end, from what I'm doing as a paid service, I don't really want to put in a petroleum product that could catch fire. Well, we be so, in the military. Right, so I don't put have around. a lot of experience, but I find it works for a lot of things. I feel if you were to put it in its hole, like if you happen to know where its hole was, that would probably a well enough deterrent to, to run it out. But if you were just to uh, say disperse some the type of barrier it, unless you lit it, I don't think it would help. If you lit it and burned away, it would clear what was in there. But if you just put it there to soak, it might kill the weeds or what have you, but, but I don't suspect that it would run the snake in any way, unless you lit it, <laughs> then that would work. But again, to, to me, that goes back to natural habitats. It's, if there's food, if there's water, if there's things there, they're going to try to come there. Correct, they're... correct. With, with every single uh, one of these things, even even the smaller organisms, is, is exactly, it's all the same. It's water and food and harvest. And the food, pretty much, you know, the bacteria is slightly different in this regard. But in the animals and the insects, it's uh, sugar and protein. Sugar, protein, water, that's it, and hard, there's a place to stay. Uh, but that's what they're after. So uh, the garbage cans are areas that particularly we start getting into this one. Mm -hmm. and where's the raccoon? Raccoons and the possums. 
man, they're going to love the garbage cans. Uh, I'm doing an account right now. It is also a manufacturing facility. They have a 66-acre property, and they produce catalysts. <laughs> but what they do is they have multiple towers. I think they have six se six separate separate units that all, that all work together. But anyway, they have, they have pulled out 44 raccoons at this location, and it had become such a problem uh, in the regard that they were getting up into the drop ceilings and falling through. Uh, landed on a copier, took out an air duct, messed up a telephone wire. Uh, one of the employees has had was bitten. Uh, but that's uh, his own fault because there are many employees that are feeding him. Because uh, <laughs> this area being 66 acres, the actual facility might be 10 or 12 acres. So they have 50 some odd acres of wood that's protected in their fencing. Uh, so the deer, the, uh, uh, the possums, but mainly in the situation, the raccoons have all just, just piled up. So, uh, so I cleared out quite a bit, but they'll come into your garbage cans, they'll get into the attic. So uh, while y'all are working, if you hear anything walking up there, it like, can very well be a big animal that could possibly fall through and, uh, and create an issue. Um, but generally, um, you can run into situations uh, with their feces, and this, there's not any bats up here. And there's no bats on the facility, but when we start getting into the micro uh, micro organs, microorganisms there, feces is really where animals come into play with that. Uh, moisture, you can get a lot of black mold situation, uh, that like can hide behind the walls, that sort of thing. But you really got to have a fair amount of moisture involved. Uh, this seems to be a pretty dry facility in a, in a lot of areas. Um, perhaps, um, uh, but but anyway, you know, we're dealing with. It's really around the feces. And what we run into is if you have, say, a raccoon or a rat problem or bats in the wall, that feces could build up over a period of time. Uh, this is really mainly in the sense of a bat and, and the truth of how it really comes down. Is uh, just build up and a pile up in the wall. So as an example, if there was bats in the wall for 10 years, it would build up in the cinder block. As it dries up and gets older, it turns into like a dusty, powdery, microscopic thing. And then it begins to float around and then you can breathe it in. There's all kinds of probably a hundred or so different bacteria. I think uh, like, like 30 or something like that from, comes from black, black guano alone. But it can just really be a nasty situation when you get up and start floating around and you breathe it in. These are situations that occur over 10, 20 years. It's definitely not, you know, if you have a back problem, or you've got to, you know, you've got to move out and get these diseases. I had a lady last year, hers was bad. I mean, my God, she, uh, it's in the center of town. She has, a, it's a two-story house, but by the nature of how it is, it's really more of like a three-story height. And uh, going up, as we started to go up towards the second story, I could already smell it. I'm really keen on being able to smell a few things. I can smell roaches, I can smell bats, and I can smell rats. You don't have to tell me if you got them. I can tell you if you have them. <laughs> you know, I can, I can smell them. So I'm halfway up her stairs, and I already smell the bats, and that's not when you smell them. <laughs> I know when you smell them, and this is too early. I'm like, oh my God. So I look around, and we're talking and everything, and unfortunately, bats are just one of the more expensive things that we do. And discussing some of our options. So I made a half-in comment, and after the fact, I almost laughed at myself because by no means was I trying to be the goosey salesman. I was literally just speaking obviously with the lady. Because there are some times this money could be used and it's complete garbage, but I really meant it when I said it. I just looked at her, and I'm like, I i be honest, I said, as bad as this is, I just, I can't believe that somebody doesn't have a mystery illness that nobody can figure out. She stopped, she said, shut up. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough, her daughter, um, steady going to the doctor, they were at the doctor early that day, mystery disease, nobody can figure out. So, I mean, I ain't ever really stepped in it here, you know, so I'm like, well, I really think, well, she's like, we got to do it, we got to figure it out, go do it, you know, so they put it on their credit card, and Lord help them, but, um, so anyway, I got him out, and actually was across the street working on a raccoon job a couple of months ago, 
and uh, she came over and her daughter happened to be with her and uh, no more smell, no more breathing problems, daughter's fine. But I uh, took yeah. the bats and having to clean up the guana, that's really where the expense of the project was, was in that cleanup process. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so her, her daughter's doing great. So uh, the facility is very clean, uh, so there's really not any type of feces areas. Uh, as we go around, I don't see that there's any you know, puddling or molding type situations. But uh, around your personal home, if you know if there's any type of rodent you know, or animal, you know, a bat, a rat, a mouse, a raccoon, a possum, or if you have any standing water, uh, you know, any puddles in a raised house that might be you know, standing up from, say, a leaking sink or a bad septic, something like that, uh, those areas could create a really bad mold situation. It's very often overlooked because it's underneath, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so I would think that that's probably the most common area that people begin to develop a molding in their home. So, any questions on any of those topics? All right. What about the pigeon poop? Does that this be very harmful to you? Absolutely. Yeah, the pigeons, um, you know, uh, when the poop is uh, the same as the others, uh, when it is left for a while, it can definitely develop those issues. Um, when a uh, pigeon's nesting, it's, you know, it generally will be roosting up in the top bars and that sort of thing and can begin to poop down. Because of the nature of where they're at, uh, has a lot of exterior exposure, you know, so they might be in the rafter and pooping down, but with the amount of, um, you know, just drying of the air and the circulation, it's probably not going to develop a bacteria disease type situation. Uh, you really are running into that when it's like in a closed environment and it piles up over 10 or 20 years and begins to disintegrate into like a dusting powdery, microscopic powder then it floats around and you breathe it in. So if the pigeons were to be cooing in an area or really uh, dying in an area, uh, sometimes, uh, particularly in churches, that they have an old belfry. Excuse me, this right get me again. But uh, um, sometimes in an old belfry, uh, they may get up in there and the, the feces will just cake up in there, you know. So a situation like that, it, it can definitely be a problem. But an uh, area like uh, Hexion, they might just come in a bay door or something and, and drop down. So it wouldn't be a disease issue, uh, probably outside of the sanitation of the, the feces. Uh, would be some type of mite. Uh, you know, if they were nesting and roosting in it, and well, in the end, uh, if they were nesting or roosting and were there pretty regularly, uh, then some mites could develop. Um, but that would be about as far as the extent other than the nasty of the with a bat problem, like they they've probably been roofed in there for oh, years. Yeah. How do you What's get the, them out? Keep them out. Three uh, bats. You said? Yeah. What you want to do is create uh, bats are protected, um, so you're not really allowed to kill them or anything. Uh, so what we do is establish some type of ability for them to get out and not get back in. So it really falls into one of those things. Uh, that uses 